Welcome to Economics and Beyond. I'm Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with my friend, co-founder of INET, Bill Janeway. He's an economist who happened to take a 35-year sabbatical after working with Richard Kahn at Cambridge University to become a venture capitalist. And he happened to sit right on top of some of the most important transitions in society through the digital revolution and beyond. He's now ended his sabbatical and gone back with an affiliation where he teaches at Cambridge University. And I'm very proud to say that INET has just made an eight-part course with him called Venture Capital and the Economics of Innovation. Bill has so much experience. He's such a fine economist. I just watched on INET Live a tremendous session with Daron Asimoglu, where they talked about the transformation of work from the vision of technology and the vision of what you might call social need and social sustainability. Bill, thanks for joining me here today. Delighted to be with you, Rob. So, Bill, you've created an eight-part course, and I've just gone through what I'll call uh, Lecture 7. Lecture 8 comes up to the challenge of climate change. But you look back at the relationship between state and transformation of economy and society in such rigorous and illuminating detail. And I, I know people will say when they see it that you follow in the footsteps of your father, Elliot Janeway, who wrote a, a quite, quite textured and illuminating book about the war preparation at the time of FDR in the, so we might call the back end of the New Deal. So these relations between the state and the, how would I say, society as a whole and the economic structure could not be more important with climate change on the horizon and this pandemic. So let's start with what is it that you see? What is it that concerns you? What is it that you want to applaud? What's missing that you would like to introduce for us to be aware and to act on the challenges that are on the horizon? That's a multi-part question, and it deserves a multi-part answer. Um, right, first, right. That's right now, we are indeed at a moment of transition. That's what look it, we're, we're all looking at. We're all waiting somewhat with bated breath for January 20th, uh, which passes by way of January 5th, the Georgia Senate elections, which will tell us whether we how good a prospect we have of restoring some kind of coherent, compatible interaction in Washington that can actually lead rather than merely react and respond more or less incoherently to crises as they arise. Um, I am hopeful going forward uh, that we have learned and can draw on some of the rich history of this American political economy and also reflect on other experiences in other societies around the world, today including China for sure, uh, in order to recognize that as you say, looking forward, that next crisis is already with us. We've been living with us. We've lost four years completely in responding to climate change. But in doing so, we have a lot to learn from the past. Now, the lecture you watched uh, as it is getting ready for primetime uh, display on through INET, that lecture drew on my own direct experience uh, and my exploration of how the digital revolution came to be through the active engagement of the United States government, particularly elements of the Defense Department as well as NASA, and how that sponsored a broad and creative movement, not a carefully planned uh, operation. I wrote about this at length in, in my book, the lectures derived from my book, Doing Capitalism in the Innovation Economy, that was 
uh, second edition in 2018. Um, and in turn, that experience of the state moving to generate momentum that reached out across the private sector, that crowded in private investment, didn't crowd it out, that was willing to take risks at the frontier of science and technology that the private sector is not equipped to take. Uh, in fact, when you're looking at what we're looking at right now, we have had, we have had, in fact, I have to say, out of the chaos of the Trump administration, it does appear that the, the warp speed program, federal funding of research, federal recommitment, pre-commitments, pre-commitments to purchase the output of the pharmaceutical industry has radically accelerated the de time to develop a working effective vaccine, uh, just as one may argue, and I do, that the active role in the context of the Cold War of the US government funding the upstream science and serving as the first customer for the output of that technology, semiconductor chips and computers that were nowhere yet ready for commercial deployment and purchase and, and use, that accelerated the digital revolution by a generation. Now, when we look back, uh, look back to industrial mobilization for World War II, and, and my father's book encompasses the whole six years from before Pearl Harbor through uh, demobilization in 1945-6. Uh, uh, again, the lesson is, as my father put it, World War II was won on the momentum of production. And as he wrote in the book, any program of mobilization that was small enough to be planned in detail was far too small to win the war. It took, again, the kind of visionary leadership we haven't had to mobilize not just physical resources, but to inspire investment and creative investments that reached across the private sector from Henry Kaiser producing a Liberty ship a day to Walter Ruther of the United Auto Workers leading, not following, not reacting to, but driving the auto companies into conversion from civilian production, so profitable, to wartime production limited by congressional acts with profits constrained. So we've had these experiences before. We can go back all the way to the first New Deal, to how Roosevelt experimented, tried, failed with the National Recovery Administration, succeeded partially with the Public Works Administration, which was very meticulously planned for the great works of the Boulder Dam, the Tribro Bridge, the Grand Coulee Dam. Um, but then in 1935, with the recovery lagging, mobilized the Works Progress Administration that in no time flat put millions of people to work across the country and found, found after the fact that an enormous amount of what they did was of great value, not just economic value, but of social and cultural value, as well as human value of giving people work to do who desperately wanted it. So this is a long-winded way of saying we've done it before, we can do it again, but doing it is not, should not, will not succeed if it's an exercise in detailed top-down planning versus a much broader mobilization of resources where efficiency is not allowed to block effectiveness in the goals that we can define, where here the goal is pretty clear about reducing and even reversing uh, car uh, carbon, carbon change, uh, the, the um, uh, generation of the, of the greenhouse gases uh, that are threatening the planet and all of us on it. I uh, want to give our listeners just a little guidance, Bill. Uh, your father's book, which I have a copy of at your suggestion. It's called The Struggle for Survival. And I just the would struggle for the survival. First, 
It was 1951, Yale University Press. You can go to Abe Books or Amazon or whatever and find a copy. It's well worth the read. But I remembered myself chuckling when I first opened the book because the first three chapters were called Roosevelt's Gamble, Preparing for Preparedness, and the Politics of Preparedness. And that feels so germane to right now that this this process and bill i want i want to add a little bit of what i think is somewhat unique about the challenge today when roosevelt was preparing for the war the new deal had already demonstrated some substantial success in putting society back on track and trust was blossoming we've had a lot of cynicism about the role of government following the great financial crisis. As Joe Stiglitz said, the polluters got paid. Yep. There was not a lot of mortgage relief. Concentration of wealth and income intensified afterwards. Right. And nobody was put in jail or whatever symbolism you yep. think for justice. Uh, so I think it's a very interesting challenge to look at this interaction between what you might call private sector and public sector, finance and the real economy, fiscal versus monetary policy, lurking back to national development banks, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, but seeing it through the lens of a population that is skeptical of capture. And yet it is so so needed. We We can't subject ourselves to that, that despondency and defeat ourselves at the starting gate. Right. But, you know, we should we should remember we should. Well, perhaps not remember. We should recognize that in 1938, 1939, 1940, Roosevelt was not riding high. Mm. The great election of 36 had faded. The impact of that faded with the what was known and correctly known as the Roosevelt recession of 1938. Unemployment had fallen all the way from 25 percent down to 12%, and in six months went back up to 19% when Roosevelt, how shall I say, yielded to the conventional forces of good government, the deficit hawks of his day, led by his secretary of the treasury, Henry Morgenthau, and balanced the budget. FDR actually balanced the budget with unemployment at 12%, The Federal Reserve increased reserve requirements on the banks, reducing their capacity to lend. And the greatest irony of all was that arguably the signal uh, achievement of the New Deal, Social Security. Social Security was introduced by taxing people for two years before any benefits were paid out. Now, Roosevelt did that for a very powerful political reason. You know, we all have social security accounts. It's a fiction. It's a fiscal fiction. But mentally and emotionally, and this gets exactly to the point you were making, by paying into that account, everyone in America got a stake in the persistence of the social security system, which has been a third rail for any libertarian or right-wing Republican who's tried to touch it over the last 80 years. And as he put it at the time, by because of we do it this way, no, quote, damn politician can ever take away my Social Security. But the cost was an economic catastrophe, which led to a huge repudiation of the Democratic Party of the 1938 congressional election returns when the Southern segregationists began to line up with the Republicans and block uh, all sorts of fi- further retur- further reforms. So Roosevelt was facing not just Charles Lindbergh and the uh, that that movement of isolationism dramatized so chillingly in the novel by Philip Roth and the television version of it, The Plot Against America. That was the state of politics in 1940 when Roosevelt managed to break tradition, break precedent, establish a precedent, and win a third term for president. It was a contested time. So then 
to be able to define a vision and a mission before Pearl Harbor, before Pearl Harbor, that could, in the, the preparedness for preparedness period, enable the country to get moving in such a way that by the time of Pearl Harbor, we were already approaching full employment. Mobilization had begun. It had begun somewhat by stealth, but it was equipping the American economy to be, as Roosevelt put it in, in the summer of 1940, the arsenal of democracy. Now, when we think about where we are today, we have had, if you think a little bit like the isolationists who were in denial of Hitler and the fascist movement and the potential for uh, a, a, a liquidation of democracy, We've had the climate change deniers motivated sometimes by, by greed because of having sunset industries on which they're dependent economically and financially, sometimes by fear, sometimes by ignorance, sometimes by tribal partisan affiliation. But overcoming that denialism is like overcoming the isolationism at the end of the 1930s in the preparation to be able to respond actively, aggressively, and effectively to Pearl Harbor. Yes. I remember uh, Naomi Klein's book, This Changes Everything, was not really about climate science being rediagnosed, but the fear on the right that people had that if you say the market isn't adequate, and we need to use the state for climate change. It sets a precedent for using it in many other contexts. That is so correct. That is so correct. The underlying denial of climate change, I entirely agree with that point, is the fear that government would demonstrate that in direct contradiction of Ronald Reagan, it's not the problem. It is, in fact, a necessary component of the solution, not the full solution, but a necessary component. Now, there's something else, Robin, and this is where um, it's not quite, we shouldn't be taking a victory lap, but something has happened uh, reinforced by COVID, by the pandemic, that represents a sea change, both in our shared profession and discipline of economics, but also in the context in which public policy of all sorts is now being discussed. It wasn't an issue in the 50s and 60s. It became an issue. And the issue I'm talking about is the distribution of income and wealth, as you briefly alluded to. As you well know, as many of our listeners will know, between the end of the middle 1970s, certainly since 1980, there has been an enormous increase in the inequality of income and wealth in the US an enormous um, uh, uh, capture of the fruits of economic growth by a small, very small, really it's not just the 1%, as much as the 0.1%, the 0.1% um, capture of those fruits. While for most Americans, for 50 to 60% of the country, real incomes, real spendable income, has remained flat and real wealth is vanishingly small, if not actually negative. As you know, I recently wrote uh, an essay in appreciation of the book published, really sponsored by INET, by Lance Taylor called Macroeconomic Inequality, which I think is a wonderful contribution to this debate. And when we talk about response to climate change, it is essential that the distributional aspects of policies mobilized in response to climate change are in the forefront of our minds. Um, yes. Our friend Joe yes. Stiglitz, uh, along with Nick Stern, co-chaired this um, commission on carbon prices, carbon prices and carbon taxes. And mm -hmm. out of that came a very powerful lesson. You know, most economists the, um, the knee-jerk response uh, to climate change is to say, well, the problem is that we have a negative externality 
from economic activity, which is called the generation of greenhouse gases, global warming. And if we could only put a price on that, the market would take care of both reducing consumption of it and production because of the, the price being higher and rewarding investment in avoiding and reducing the incidence of that tax. But of course, that tax is necessarily an extremely regressive tax. There are people who have to drive to work because they don't have the public transit system that the state was disabled from providing them with. It is a very regressive tax. So any movement in that direction, as Joe Stiglitz has written with great rigor, needs to be thought in terms of how do we how do we recycle that money? How do we make that not just not a regressive tax, but even progressive in its net impact by using the revenue generated to restructure and recompensate the losers from the imposition of from, from the uh, higher cost of energy into being able to have uh, a, a, a positive response to it. The fact is, we don't just have to look at uh, the rejection of climate change uh, as, a, as, a, as a crisis that needs to be addressed from the right. We also have to recognize that the standard economic uh, solution is very damaging to those who have least and therefore must be put into a much richer context. I was reading uh, a little bit about the experience that the French government had with the yellow vests. Exactly and, uh, right. Talking to the scholar James Boyce about the notion of a carbon dividend. And yep. what, he, what he said, uh, in, in exactly aligned with you, was that there was a tension. On the one side, as the late and famous author Jane Jacobs talked about in her last book, Dark Age Ahead. She said, when you were in Ontario, she lived in Toronto, and they talked to ministers in Ontario about preparing for climate change. This is 2004 and five. They said, oh no, it would cost too many jobs in the fossil fuel industry. We can't do that. So that, that tension is there. The carbon dividend is also in tension because if it's used to ameliorate inequality and what you might call lubricate consensus for moving forward, it's also begging the question of how you finance the Green New Deal. And many people who are traditional economists have wanted to use the proceeds of carbon pricing right. to finance that, uh, what you might call transformation led by a government fiscal policy of uh, addressing particularly the transportation system. Well, one, one, one reason I'm um, relatively, I, I, I would, temperamentally I am an optimist, I can't avoid it, but one reason I'm looking forward at that whiteboard you put up at the start of this conversation with some degree of optimism is I think that the president-elect uh, has been clear in his recognition, uh, and this is where what happens in Georgia on January 5th really matters, um, Taxes are going up. Uh, at least the 2017 tax cut needs to be reversed. Uh, but similarly, the fact that when you look at the incidence of taxation on income, instead of being progressive, as you get towards the 99th percentile, the incidence of taxation drops like a stone. And that, you, you don't know exactly when, and you don't know exactly how, but sometimes there are things that you know that, you know exactly that. And one thing is that taxes are going to be going up, but they're going to be going up disproportionately as they should for the highest end of the, of the income distribution. There's another factor here as well. Um, there's... A, a really brilliant young fellow. He's an Australian who uh, has lived in the U.S. He's an MIT graduate like you, um, named Saul Griffith, who's been done done some tremendously creative work 
on practical programs for addressing climate change that begin with, if you like, the second great electrification and the manner in which, not just in terms of uh, the smart grid, the ability to absorb renewables into the uh, uh, renewable uh, sources, intermittent sources of energy into the grid without destroying it, but actually the democratization of electrification, not just led by Elon Musk into automobiles, but across the board into housing and and, uh, heating systems. And that goes with uh, the impact of really distributing out solar panels as they become practically as ex, you know as expensive as you know as, as, as the plastic bags we don't want to use anymore, where the financing think of it like the creative revolution of the 1920s in the consumer economy was consumer finance. It was the installment plan, a federal bank that can provide the intermediating finance for households up and down the spectrum of income to be able to participate in the radical reduction in cost over time that would come with everything from insulating houses and buildings to producing an integratable, locally localized, democratized energy infrastructure for the economy, which happens along the way to generate a hell of a lot of jobs, a hell of a lot of income, and a hell of a lot of tax revenue for the government. You know, the supervisor of my thesis, the great Richard Kahn, uh, he made his name when he was really a very young man with the idea of the multiplier, the notion that government spending financed by borrowing when there were unused resources could generate enough income from increased economic activity to pay for itself. I don't worry a hell of a lot about being able to pay for the Green New Deal because I think the progressive impact on the economy and on the jobs created and the incomes generated will go a long way to paying for the transformation of the economy. I think you're exactly right about that. And I I also... uh... How would I say? Since that right now, the well, some have told me in these podcasts I've been doing, I've done a, well over a hundred of them this year. Hmm. Some have said to me, "Well, everybody's going to be so exhausted by the pandemic that the idea of changing jobs or evolving sectors there won't be any support for, and that everyone's going to want to just go back to work, or they'll be worried." As you mentioned. Uh, in early earlier eras about we've spent so much on the pandemic, we don't have the fiscal capacity, a little bit like the retrenchment that Roosevelt went through. I think that's wrong. I think that what where we are is that the notion of the transformation that climate challenge represents is essential to survival. Necessity yep. will be the mother of invention, and we will support aggregate demand in a way that will make Lance Taylor smile in the right. process. And and it depends upon doing things well and efficiently with how the private and public interact in the transformation of the energy system to achieve that sustainable low carbon economy. And people like Saul Griffith can uh, will be guiding lights in that process. I'm hopeful. But I, so, I really, I don't, I don't see this as, I see it as a call to action more than a calamity. Oh, I agree with you. And I, I do want to just make a couple of points here, Rob. One is, let's not get hung up too much on efficiency, not when it comes to, you know, building the equivalent of the, of the Grand Coulee Dam, but when it comes to the still necessary investment in innovation at the frontier. For example, there's no more important uh, uh, hang up uh, in moving forward aggressively with the deployment of renewable sources of energy, of intermittent sources of energy, than, than energy storage technologies that can work at grid scale. We have a, a big set of issues here. 
Now, this is where we can learn directly from how we got it right in the early days of the digital revolution. The Defense Department, and not just DARPA, but DARPA became the spear point, made a really important point of not, not selecting national champions and endowing them with exclusive access to the financial resources to push the technology forward. On the contrary, they sponsored and defended against the big uglies, the IBMs and AT&Ts, the new companies, the Intels, the Texas Instruments, the ones who proved out that we could produce electronic switching devices from sand, that's silicon, uh, that we could do it. And the Defense Department went further. It was the first customer. It pulled them down the learning curve to low cost, reliable output that became ready for commercial prime time with the personal computer revolution of roughly 1980. Now, we've had the same opportunity, but you know, this is the kind of thing that just, you know, is, is so frustrating. DARPA is still cranking along with a budget of 3.3 billion a year. It's now more intensely focused on more purely military specific innovation. ARPA-E, Advanced Research Projects Agency Energy, has gotten 300 million a year, one-tenth the amount. Every budget of the Trump administration included provision for closing it down and requested a budget just big enough to pay the bills and send everybody home. Congress kept it alive on life support, but it's had a marginal impact relative to the magnitude of the need, which is certainly, in fact, transcends the needs of the Cold War, the technological needs of the Cold War. Beyond that, the, um, the, un, the, the, I have to say that with the best will in the world, the Obama administration got something dead wrong at the time of the, of the, of the limited stimulus bill. And no doubt in part, because of, frankly, uh, perhaps excessive conventional economic thinking in the formulation of it, but also constraints on the total amount of spending, the only gestures towards response to climate change were the famous loan guarantees to a set of venture-backed early stage companies. One of them was Tesla, which paid back its loan out of the massive amounts of billions of dollars it raised from the private sector. But one of them was a, was a uh, solar panel company called Solyndra that rather disastrously and visibly and publicly went bankrupt. And another was an innovative battery technology company whose technology wound up being sold for nothing to the Russians, uh, having received loan guarantees. Those companies didn't need loan guarantees. They needed procurement contracts. They needed, just like Pfizer and Moderna got, they needed pre-commitment. If you build it, we'll buy it. And then we'll find out if it works or how to make it work better or how to improve it, both the performance and the cost over time. Because we, the U.S. government, the American people, we're your first collaborative, supportive customer. And we don't have to wait for the efficient, clearly profitable output to be proven for the general market. We have a mission. We have a mission that justifies our taking the risk, just as we government has had a mission to get vaccines produced, generated, developed, produced as rapidly as possible. If there's one lesson from that lecture you were watching uh, that I hope really gets through to the, to the INET audience, it's that lesson. It's how the mission-driven government can play a role that is not available for the private sector to play, not just in funding upstream science, which of course it must play, but also in, in being the first customer that can pull the new, the, the output, the fruits of the new technology down the learning curve to be ready for commercial prime time.
Yeah, to use the parlance of economics, the upstream research is the public good. The aggregate demand is what you might call the mission-driven priority. By creating sustainable demand and and therefore the confidence for the private sector firms to evolve and develop, modernize and produce the the goods that they might not otherwise have had the confidence to do without those, yeah, look, which you might call or, order books. If the Defense Department it, it had been closed down as it was in 1946, if it had never been refunded as it was as a, because of the, the Cold War and above all of the hot shooting war in Korea, we would have wound up with digital computers. You know, there were projects in IBM, there were projects in AT&T, Bell Labs, um, there, it, there would have emerged, the British were developing digital computers based on the work of the great Alan Turing, um, mm-hmm. but it would have taken a generation longer. I promise you, we would not all have been on Zoom this year <laughs> if we hadn't had that jump start that accelerated the development and deployment of digital technologies by a full generation. So Bill Hambrick, that I met in a Princeton-related gathering in uh, in San Francisco. And he said to me, at the time I worked in the hedge fund industry, he said, the people here who will thrive will pe- are the people who will go back and study the space program and its spinoffs, but also understand the structure of demand that the government will supply and those are the firms that will win out, the ones that win those contracts. So he, would, he was just framing your model exactly yeah. based on his, at the analog of state-private collaboration interaction during the space program. You know, it, there, there was a, uh, there's, there's a neat little pair of numbers that um, the great David Mowry, who is the historian of all of this, uh, investment in technology, the state role in the um, early days of the digital revolution uh, that he pulled out of that show that at, at the end of the 50s, the Defense Department was giving something like 70 plus, three quarters of all of its research funding that went to the private sector. It was giving them to what I call the big uglies, IBM and AT&T and such. Mm-hmm. But the contracts the production contracts for the semiconductor chips that whose yield was terrible, whose cost was so high, you had to, you know, you, you could get very few off a wafer that really worked. Those were going to the new companies. More than half, almost, almost the same percentage was going to the Intels and the Texas Instruments. And that was, as I say, the, the model that should have been followed with Solyndra and A123 and, and um, uh, Tesla, and that should be followed today in an aggressive program of accelerating the needed technology to go into the, 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 the embodiment of the Green New Deal. By the way, I do want to add something here as well. You, you had a, referred to a recent conversation. I had a great conversation just the other day with someone who's become a champion, a very thoughtful uh, and, and, and uh, uh, champion with real clout uh, on climate change and the response to it named Mark Carney, the former governor uh-huh. of the Bank of England, before that the head of the Canadian Bank, the Canadian National Bank, and who has really taken a lead role here and has very much uh, echoes the kind of thinking we've been talking about, including the concern for the distributional impact and the political consequences of ill thought through efficient, economically efficient, but politically contentious policy responses to climate change. Uh, Mm -hmm. You should, you should get him on your podcast. Yeah. I've actually reached out to him because he's just done these BBC wreath lectures, which uh, I I find very very INET like. The, uh, well, he certainly cites Michael Sandel in this first one. Yes. Very and, strong. But he's, he's talking about the difference between what he calls a market economy and a market society. 
and right. how some institutions become what you might call refracted in purpose. We could talk about money in politics and the commodification of social design, regulation, enforcement as right. something that's pulling things off course. Some of the privatization of universities has given people heartburn about yep. what it is universities are really doing as distinct from the traditional which you might call romantic view of what education means. Right. But Mark, Mark really was delving into that and delving into the history of thought and the classics and the philosophers around right. the Scottish Enlightenment. Yep. And, uh, and he's taken it on to resilience and the financial crisis and now to the COVID-19 and its implications for what we need to learn. And I believe there's still a fourth lecture yep. coming up soon. Well, you know, something you just said is is also, you know, it, there's a major theme in everything I've, I've been doing, the lessons I learned as a venture capitalist, reintegrating that into what I call paleo-Keynesian economics, <laughs> the, uh, economics of radical uncertainty, of uh, decision-making by people who know that they can't know the full outcome of, of, of their decisions, the full consequences of their decisions. And it, it, it relates to what I was saying about how efficiency can be the enemy of effectiveness, particularly at the frontier, where we make progress by trial and error and error. And I referred to, you know, Roosevelt's um, famous uh, commitment in his first campaign back in 1932, when he said that the country is demanding bold, persistent experimentation. Uh, try something. If it fails, admit it frankly, uh, and then move on. But for heaven's sake, try something. And that is the message that I really want to get across. It's what worked in industrial mobilization in World War II. It's what worked in the Cold War construction of the foundations of the digital revolution. And it's the way we really need to go in building an effective consensus-based response to climate change. Bill, I thought uh, I want to bridge back to that, but through a pathway that comes from your Lecture 7. Yes, sir. In, in Lecture 7, you describe this process whereby hardware and software and data and things and, and the entire digital transformation is, how would I say, given impetus by the government. But then you, you bring forward a very interesting contradiction, yes. which is how the financialization and the mobilization of technology and capital and not people changes what you might call the stresses of social sustainability and at some level, the ability of government to protect people. What, what I'm seeing is a situation where, ironically, the government succeeded tremendously in transforming the structure of the economy through the digital and computer and, and data revolutions. That facilitated globalization it strengthened the relative power of the factors, technology and financial capital. And with financialization, it made it much harder to stabilize the macroeconomy. It exacerbated income distribution, uh, skewing things towards concentration at the upper end. And in the middle of that is what I'll call the Reagan ideology which yeah. says government is the problem, not the solution, right after government had been part of the solution that exactly. led to a vibrant is, transformation. Rob, this is what I, I call the great reversal. The, the state, the American state, which had sponsored all of the technologies which combined to create the digital revolution, the digital revolution then matured to the point where it turned on the state and demonstrated through, what you say, the, the consequences enabled by information technology of globalization, uh, the elimination of friction in, in the movement of not just goods and services, but also of work through outsourcing, uh, automation, 
uh, an ex a, a further, you know, yet another wave. This is not the first one. This is not the first rodeo we've seen. It goes back to the automation out of existence of the handloom weavers of England in the 1830s, 1820s, 30s, 40s. Um, and then the financialization of the system, all of these a function of the digital revolution, producing that increase in inequality, that, that precarity of employment, of life for a majority of the people, demonstrating the state's inability to buffer the constituents, its constituents, from the consequences of the revolution it had organized. This is a great historical irony that it's possible even uh, Karl Marx might have appreciated, and Keynes certainly would have. Um, it, and it goes with hand in glove with, indeed, the neoliberal contraction of the scope and scale of the state and the ele elevation of the market as both the locale, the venue for economic activity and the judge and jury over which economic activity is worth supporting. Uh, yes. it, went with, it went with the retreat of economics as a discipline from any concern with distribution at all for a long generation until Thomas Piketty, whose, uh, whose, uh, whose data was uh, access to data was funded by INA. Uh, and it mm -hmm. puts us today at a point where, and this is, this is where kind of you, you and I really have come together over this last decade, uh, to be able to get our heads as individuals, but much more importantly, our social cohesion as members of multiple communities, some defined economically, some politically, some socially, get on the same page means depends upon not just technological advance, not just recognition of a looming threat. It depends on reconstructing the framework in which public policy is discussed, debated, and decided. I mean, I take that to yes. be INET's mission. I take that to be my own personal uh, set of goals within that broader mission. And that does include taking history seriously, taking the uh, market failures not as anomalies to be explained away, but as central factors in how we think about how the world works and fails to work, and why again and again, whether it's the global financial crisis or the COVID pandemic, the state is called upon in extremis by the private sector to protect it from itself. Yes. I... Uh... I'm reminded, Bill, I know you've spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley, and I've spent a lot of time in the last 20 years in Northern California uh, in a place called Bolinas. And there was a famous poet, Richard Browdigan, who oh, yes. wrote a poem called All Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace. <laughs> and Adam Curtis, the rebel documentarian from the BBC, who has who's done fabulous work in many contexts, uh, he made a, which you might call uh, a three-part documentary that illuminated the contradiction between all the people in Silicon Valley and the Bay Area who were benefiting from the digital revolution, who all then became libertarians who, as he said, right. named their children Ein or Rand. Yeah. But then you look back and they kind of used what I will call the new age left of the whole earth catalog to create a romance around the libertarian nature, except when you really looked under the hood, like you did in lecture seven, they were all the product of government yeah. support. Right. And, uh, and how, how they could walk away from that and go into this libertarian fantasy was, was very hard for me to digest having worked in government and actually been a partner of George Soros, who, while we played in, you know, very vigorously in the financial markets, we were seeing the market imperfections as the yep. essence of where the opportunity came from. 
and, and not the fantasy of market efficiency. A a absolutely. And, and um, I will, we can't conclude this conversation without my calling out my, uh, my close friend and, and my most ad admired individual in Silicon Valley, Tim O'Reilly. Uh, yes. His book, which has a much zippier title than mine, it's called WTF, What's the Future? Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. He is a, an insider critic uh, and scholar and guru of the contradictions of Silicon Valley's yes. version of capitalism uh, and a most thoughtful and uh, knowledgeable observer uh, and very much part of, part of our world. I would add that his wife, Jen Palka, Jen Palka was, was not only um, uh, Deputy Chief Technology Officer in the Obama White House, but perhaps even more importantly, I would say more importantly, founder uh, and for a number of years, CEO of a remarkable initiative. This is the kind of thing that does give you hope. Uh, it's called Code for America. It's a mobilization of talent, young talent overwhelmingly, to take the tools that have been developed that we see perhaps most readily in the interactions people as individuals have and as groups have through social media, bring them to state and local government, bring them to reduce the friction, eliminate the impedance mismatch between engines of state policy and the individual people, the constituents, who need access to them. In California, for example, they took access to the California's version of the food stamp program. The way it had been designed and built by some mega consulting system integration business, it went through you know, dozens and dozens of screens. It was took so long that if you were in a public library where you only had access to a computer and the internet for 30 minutes, you could not complete your application. And they turned it, yep. for good, you know, they turned it into as easy to, to sign up for and log into as to create a, a, a Facebook or a Twitter account. And it had a huge impact. I, re I remember going to work on behalf of Jen to my, what I'll call the Pete Domenici alumni Republicans I used to work with because I felt yep. like she was making government more efficient and less expensive and that lots right. of Republicans could get behind that. And uh, yep. I don't think I was as successful well, as you, I you, should have you been may have had, or would like to have been. I think you may have had an impact because Code for America has worked in some uh, states. and They really work at state and local government level. They've worked in states with Republican governors. They've been invited in and have had real, yep. real impact. Scaling that yeah. up, that's a challenge, but it's a, it's a demonstration yeah. proof that this technology can be used for good by well-meaning people who know what they're doing. And that's exactly the kind yes. of initiative we're going to need very broadly displayed to, to, to respond effectively to climate change. As I say, it won't be done by top-down direction any more than World War II was won that way. Yep. Well, we also should learn some lessons uh, from my friend Andrea Gabor about the reform of education, where she's yep. used the analogy of uh, Edward Deming, W. Edward Deming, right. and the bottom up local empowerment and innovation that comes from which you might call the people that make the product, in this case, education being much more effective than the top-down, what we might yeah. call plutocratic monitoring and coercion systems. And her book, After the Education Wars, is an enormously illuminating example of, the, of these, uh, what you might call decentralized approaches. Right, right. It, it does Im involve empowering, empowering people on the shop floor, empowering people in the schoolroom, empowering people across the board. And that, and this is where the digital technologies absolutely are resources for a potential powerful good. Yes, I agree. I agree. So, Bill, you've uh, illuminated 
so many of what you might call the contradictions between the what you might call separation or bifurcation of the public sector and the private sector. You've showed how in many instances they've been complementary and the public sector has been necessary to success. I think this is very important at a time, which I mentioned earlier in this broadcast, where people are what you might call despondent or cynical, because we can't afford to be despondent or cynical. The potentials, the constructive examples like your father wrote about, like you've created in your lectures, there, there's or like Jen is putting forward with Code for America, suggests that there is a pathway for private-public collaboration. But one of the things that's necessary is a healing of the trust in governance yeah. and expertise and the use of knowledge. Because those, those uh, valuable inputs and ingredients have been denigrated very markedly in recent years. They have been. Uh, it's, it's been a long generation, uh, but obviously the last four years took it to levels that we, I think, frankly, could not have imagined. And we I have agree. a long way to go working back from that. I'm hopeful uh, that in the new administration and with some evidence, some evidence coming out of the uh, survivors on the Republican side of their hostile of the hostile takeover, which they've experienced, uh, that there may be a, that there is a path forward here. And, you know, maybe this is a, the last point I really would like to make. The war has been an economic driver of innovation going back to the British Army learning, uh, driving the Adam Smithian productivity revolution through the division of labor in the manufacture of the construction of rifles, of muskets in Birmingham, England. Great book by uh, Satya uh, on uh, uh, the empire of guns, it's called. Um, war again and again has been what legitimized the active, what my friend Mariano Mazzucato called the entrepreneurial state in playing this role at the frontier of innovation. Well, here's the thing about climate change, as the president-elect would say. Here's the thing. We get the opportunity to define a broad beneficial mission for all that legitimizes and mobilizes upstream investment and research, procurement contracts at the frontier of the possible before it becomes the reliable. We, we get the chance to do that without killing anybody. This is not, this is a mobilization on behalf of humanity, not on behalf of a portion of humanity dedicated to killing the other enemy portion. What a gift. What an opportunity. <laughs> Let us yes, seize indeed. it. And one of the things that I think becomes important, our mutual friend and INET fellow, Michael Sandel, has emphasized, which is in his new book, The Tyranny of Meritocracy, yeah. is how education has to be used to cultivate awareness, lateral pattern recognition, incorporation of history, and an integrated vision of how to meet the challenges on behalf of society. And that credentialism, rather than education, cannot be a substitute which allow right. elites to be self-satisfying and not focused on the public good, right. but on and their that, own security. I think it's very touches, important. That touches on a, a subject that's very near and dear to my heart, and that is the excessive focus on the STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, to the uh, limited... Uh, attention to the social sciences and the negligible attention to the humanities. I think about the yes. global financial crisis. I think about the sources, the uh, consequences, 
and how much we would all have benefited from a broader segment, not just of the policy making portion of the society, but much more broadly of people who on the one hand were aware of the great chapter 12 in Keynes's general theory on the uh, long-term expectations, the work of Hyminsky on endogenous financial crises on the one hand, and on the other, the great novel by Anthony Trollope, The Way We Live Now, that is the most perfect narrative of fraud and speculation and destruction in its in its footsteps. That's worth a hell of a lot more than another class of um, engineering uh, practice or coding, uh, which is yeah. a, a, a you know a, a commodity. Uh, but that knowledge and understanding that Sandal talks about, the ability to put in context, deep historical and human context, uh, these forces that loose in our society, that's what's really critical and is very much underappreciated. Yes. Well, I think Homer's Odyssey, the works of Shakespeare, the Divine Comedy, yep. some of the, the poem, John Dos Passos, Herman Melville, we can go on and on, but th those are essential ingredients into what I will call the humility that expertise needs to a, navigate there, through the challenges and the emotions of a life very well. There's a British podcast about books that I'm, del I, I, I'm absolutely committed to called Backlisted. And the end of the year, they always ask, well, what are the three most important books you've read, old books that you've read? And of course, we've had more time to read old books this past year than we wanted to have. <laughs> and I have yes. to say, the three books that I finally had read, all of which had been sitting there looking at me for only about 50 years, were um, War and Peace, The Plague by Camus, and The Varieties of Religious Experience by William James. Ah, and they are yes. all profoundly right. relevant to the situation in which we now found ourselves. Yes, yes, those are excellent. Well, I want to put in for one more for everybody to read, which is slightly away from the humanities, but underscores the themes that we have discussed today. And that's a book that Cambridge University Press called, put out, that's called Doing Capitalism by a guy named Bill Janeway. I think, uh, I think your, your exploration, not unlike Odysseus, has been through lots of storms, lots of different sources of what I'll call inductive stimulus, but you have the deductive training, you have the, the formal skills, and, and it's marvelous to read your book, Doing Capitalism, or for that matter, to talk with you and see all of these dimensions of mind and spirit integrated so nicely. So thank you for being with me today, Bill. I look forward to, yeah. as we turn the corner, perhaps in the spring and summer, coming back to it, maybe we'll bring Tim O'Reilly and his son-in-law, Saul Griffith, onto Absolutely. the uh, podcast with us and, and we'll or do a webinar together. But uh, That would be great, Rob. I, this is, as, as, as usual, every conversation with you is stimulating. And <clears throat> I, I, I have to say that I, I certainly learn as much uh, as I hope I've been uh, expounding uh, from it. It was a great experience. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll talk again soon. Yeah. Bye-bye. And check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.